Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending the McKinley Street Grade Separation Project Information Meeting via Zoom and on the phone. My name is Matt Evans. I am on the public outreach team for the project and will serve as tonight's moderator. Joining me tonight will be Savat Kampu, the city's public works director and city engineer. And I also have with me Josh Cosper and Darren Johnson, both program managers at Mark Thomas, the city's project management consultant. This meeting will be recorded and will be posted to the project website at coronaca.gov. All attendees joining will be muted and cameras will remain off for the entirety of the meeting. If you are joining us via the Zoom platform, please submit your questions using the QA button on your screen. And if you're joining us by the phone, you may email your questions to mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. That's mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. During the Q&A session, we will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Tonight, our team will be making about a 20 minute presentation. For those of you who hadn't had the chance to attend the meetings in the past, we are gonna begin with a brief project overview, a look at where we are with utility relocation. Next, we'll discuss current construction activities, including recent activities, current staging, recommended detour plans, future staging activities, and a brief look ahead before wrapping up with our future public outreach efforts. And then as promised, at the end of our presentation, we look forward to being able to answer all of your questions during a Q&A session. So to begin the presentation, I would now like to turn it over to Savat with the city. Savat. Thanks, Matt. As discussed, this will be a quick run through of the project improvements. Uh, this here, you can see, is a project configura configuration in the after condition. Uh, McKinley Street will be a four-lane facility, two in each direction. Magnolia Avenue is on the left side of the slide, and the 91 Freeway on the right side with Sampson Avenue down the center. In this rendering, you can see uh, the 91 Freeway to the upper right and Estelle to the lower left side. This is a view looking northwesterly of the bridge. In this view, you can see a good view of the steel network arch bridge looking westerly. It is a lightweight structure that can be built in a staging area where the old uh, Denny's and uh, Outback used to be area and moved into place overnight, which we expect to occur early next year. This is a great view looking southeasterly where you can see some of the retaining walls as you can see, they will have the dot pattern as previously presented. Here's a good view looking northeasterly where you can see the McKinley Street southbound side ramp connecting to the Sampson Avenue. And this is a good view looking southbound over the bridge and a good close up. Overall, we estimate the project to still cost between 125 and 128 million with the city um, having approximately 125 million funding for the project. We are currently working with Walsh Construction and our construction management firm, Falcon, on several valley engineering exercises to help make sure we stay below the budget. Most recently, we are evaluating ways not to replace a dual reinforced concrete box culvert north of Sampson Avenue. And with the cost rising cost increase of concrete and cement materials, we're looking at the option of using select fill to be more cost effective than the lightweight cellular concrete, which is more expensive these days. And adjustments to the MSC walls along McKinley Street that would reduce overall wall construction costs tremendously. We will continue collaboration on finding cost or schedule efficiencies. And I'd like to turn it over to Josh Cosper with Mark Thomas to talk about the utilities and early construction activities. Thanks, Savat. So we presented this slide in the last couple quarterly updates. So to refresh your memory, AT&T shown in orange and the gas company shown in yellow are entirely complete with their relocation. Riverside Public Utility uh, water line shown in blue. They've been in the ground since March, but uh, testing and connections have had some challenges over the last four to five months. With that said, uh, testing and the service connections are now complete. Uh, and they expect to have full completions and demobilization by the end of this month. Southern California Edison, shown in red, is uh, urgently trying to finish all their work. 
all of the underground infrastructure has been completed and is expected, uh, and they're expected to remove the overhead poles and complete their cutover and underground uh, their facilities by early September. So we were expecting to have a flurry of utilities relocate during stage 1A construction. However, there was an opening to squeeze them in with night work and we were able to have uh, both Ch Charter, Time Warner and uh, MCI complete all their work in early June. Queststar performed their early uh, cut and cap uh, of their petroleum line late June. And then uh, this is gonna help minimize the amount of work outside of our, inside our construction zone now that we've started and the remaining activities uh, that uh, they, we need to coordinate with them during construction. So this includes the SCE work I mentioned previously, the typical miscellaneous adjustments and relocations that are gonna occur as we're starting to increase fill and earthwork. Western municipal uh, and uh, city, uh, 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 sorry, Western municipal and the city utilities uh, department underground water and wastewater improvements. And lastly, closing out the paperwork between RPU and WMWD in the city regarding uh, with regards to our utility cooperative agreements. Overall, we are seeing cost savings also from RPU, what they originally projected from their costs as well. So I'm really excited finally to announce as of July 11th, construction has started. And so the uh, first order of work uh, was going to be installing or was installing the temporary signal at the uh, Samson circled in yellow. To get to this level, there were weeks and weeks of timing, workshops, practice software runs going back earlier this year. Uh, even with that said, we still had some field challenges, but we we're able to work it out by July 13th. So as part of the traffic control efforts, you can see in yellow where the closed, uh, where we closed the exterior northbound lane for McKinley Street, including uh, some of the driveway entrances. Uh, so additionally, I do wanna spend some time to go into detail uh, on the Samson Avenue intersection as there's been some challenges working through some of the pattern, uh, habits and patterns from uh, the, the public traffic. So in orange, we closed the eastbound left turn lane the westbound uh, exterior lane and extended the McKinley closure northbound uh, through the intersection. These closures are necessary uh, as there will be significant pile drilling construction and construction operations Darren's gonna talk about shortly, north and south of Samson Avenue. Um, traffic along Samson going in the eastbound interior lane can turn left or it can go through as you can see uh, with the yellow arrows. And exterior eastbound uh, lanes can go, or lane can go through or turn right. One of the challenges we had uh, in this area were people were making illegal left turns from the car wash driveway entrances and actually resulted in a small minor collision. Uh, even before construction, this turn movement wasn't legal. However, now that we've got the active construction going on, it becomes much more of a safety issue. So we're going to be implementing extra delineators, signage, and other uh, BMPs to uh, help prevent this movement from continuing throughout construction. Traffic in the westbound direction can turn right, go through or go left. One challenge we've seen is when uh, trains are crossing, this uh, intersection in particular is uh, actually programmed to uh, um, uh, shut down to make sure left turn doesn't happen. So queuing doesn't happen or the ability to, to actually get on the train tracks doesn't happen. And so what'll happen is anybody turning left in the front of the line has to wait until the train has passed, which creates some congestion sometimes up the KPC Parkway. So what you see on the screen now is we're gonna be adding a left turn lane uh, and making adjustments to traffic control to help reduce this uh, congestion and impacts. And then lastly, shown in yellow there, we're pre preserving pedestrian crossings through the first early phases uh, of construction. So one other item we recently finished construction of was the new uh, entryway to the adult daycare entrance uh, in, in accordance with our acquisition. You can see in yellow where we uh, opened up the perimeter wall and uh, had to perform some asphalt work that you can see on the screen now. So moving forward, the ingress and egress will actually occur through the Estelle intersection uh, for the project there for access. So uh, typical with all construction, traffic control needs to be a little flexible early on to help calibrate with uh, just traffic habits in general. Um, along the northbound McKinley Street, there have been complaints uh, regarding congestion. So you know, we understand before construction, you're driving along northbound McKinley Street and it would take normally four to five minutes to get from Magnolia to Sampson. 
And now it's frustrating because it's about 10 minutes uh, during the AM and PM peak uh, traffic. So we're actively monitoring this and uh, uh, see backup occurs all the way up to Mag uh, Magnolia from Samson. And so sometimes people are going to get stuck into a couple signal cycles. You can kind of see it in that uh, drone shot from a, uh, we had from a couple of weeks ago in the upper right. So we're, we're looking into things of implementing early video detection or video detection earlier than we anticipated and tweaks to the timing to, uh, to help kind of clean some of this up and uh, minimize the queuing as best as we can. Um, one other area that has congestion is the westbound Samson I previously discussed. You know, as I mentioned, it can back up to KPC Parkway with train crossings. It gets frustrating too with uh, people uh, using shopping centers to drive through and avoid it, which creates potential safety issues. As I mentioned, the, the turn lane and other measures we uh, we're, are going to include, we're just going to continue to monitor this and uh, you know adjust as we need to. So lastly, as I mentioned, uh, what we have for the plan for the illegal left turns on the eastbound Samson traffic. So one thing to note, though, of, of the many grade separations I've worked on, this is going significantly smoother to start construction. You know, most importantly, cars aren't stopping over the train tracks, creating major safety issues. Uh, you know, additionally, the delays are relatively minor compared to other projects I've seen. So I think the public's done a great job in using recommended detour plans and avoiding peak conditions. But with that said, I just wanted to briefly discuss the detour plan. So in our December meeting, I went into a lot of detail for the recommended detours. The outreach meeting from that December meeting was recorded. It's posted on the city's website, so you can actually see the in-depth. So I'm gonna try to keep this one brief and more general. You know, the main roads to use are Magnolia Avenue. It connects both I-15 and SR-91. Promenade Avenue, which can be uh, accessed either at Magnolia or Sampson, uh, Sampson Avenue through Mariah Circle. Uh, Promenade should connect you to McKinley on the north side of the 91 freeway. And then lastly, the I-15 uh, could be used as well. With that said, I'm gonna turn it over to Darren for the discussions on staging through construction as uh, previously presented as well. Thanks, Josh. So yeah, now let's talk briefly about how the project will be built. Uh, the approach we're going to go through here will likely be refined as the contractor gets more integrated into the project. So there might be a few changes as we get closer to each phase. Um, right now, we're actually in the first phase of construction, what we call stage one. By the end of this phase, traffic that's crossing the railroad will be reduced to one lane in each direction while the abutments and bridge foundations are under construction. This is gonna occur, this one lane in each direction will occur from just south of Magnolia to just north of Sampson Avenue. But all intersections should remain fully operational during this phase of construction. So now we'll go to what we call stage two. During this stage, traffic will be moved to the east side of McKinley and to the south side of Estelle. And at some point, we're gonna to need to close the Estelle, Samson, and the 91 ramp intersections for up to about 55 hours, essentially a weekend closure. And these three locations will all be worked on and closed at different times, but we do need to close these intersections to complete some significant fill and paving operations. That's because McKinley Street will ultimately need to be up at a much higher elevation than it is today to get up and over the railroad tracks. And during this phase, we will also build much of the walls, the roadway, and the bridge improvements on the west side of McKinley. So now on to stage three. Traffic in stage three will be moved to the west side of McKinley to the new proposed elevations. And during this stage, you'll now be driving on the new bridge that takes you up and over the railroad tracks. Along Estelle, traffic will be moved to the north side of the road. Some of the commercial driveway entrances through here will require reconstruction and wall improvements during this phase. Also, the loop road intersection to McKinley will be constructed and remaining retaining walls and roadway improvements will also be constructed on the east side of McKinley during this stage. So that was an overview of the, the different construction stages for the duration of the project. But what's gonna happen from now through the end of the year? 
Well, it's going to start with the bridge pile and abutment construction, which includes large scale augering and dirt removals, both north and south of Sampson Avenue. It also includes placing the steel reinforcing cages with large cranes. And actually the pictures that you see here aren't actual pictures of the project, but they're examples of the type of equipment and construction you can expect to see in the next few months. This includes cranes, excavators, augering and drilling equipment. And then actually here is a good picture of from earlier this week of the crane operations to get the steel casing in place to start the pile drilling operations. We'll also be fabricating the steel bridge at that location where at Denny's and Outback used to be. We're almost done going through all of the 100 plus submittals and shop drawings for that bridge. Steel was ordered months ago. It's now being milled and assembled. And of course, on-site fabrication of the bridge structure will occur through early next year before we do the actual bridge move. Underground city utilities and storm drain facilities, primarily north of Sampson Avenue, will be happening in the next few months. And lastly, implementation of stage 1B will occur sometime in the fall. Stage 2A will occur where the roadway fill and wall work starts by about the end of the year. And uh, so overall, um, with the challenges of the project, we're still on pace to expend the SB 132 funds well before the funding deadline, which is a good thing. And the project construction will be completed by the end of 2023 for an early 2024 demobilization. So now I'm gonna let Savat talk about future public outreach efforts for the project. Thank you, Darren. I'm trying to turn on my video. I'm having technical difficulties. Here we go. Thank you, bud. Thank you for your patience. So we conducted outreach efforts on November 12th, 2020, May 4th, 2021, and December 7th, uh, 2021. The next public outreach meeting will be near the end of the year. Uh, this meeting will be done in person at a location yet to be determined, but also the option to virtually uh, view it via Zoom. And we will start circulating advertisements and broadcasts by around early November through the city's website, social media, and email letters and blasts. So what other outreach elements have we done? To continue from the business outreach meetings early, um, early March of this year, city staff have sent out flyers and are contacting business owners about the availability, available programs and support. We have developed a text program and over 380 people are, have subscribed to it. We also included how to describe uh, in the public broadcast, but just text McKinley to 844-518-1409 to get uh, continual updates. And we have been and will continue sending out public broadcasts and outreach notices through the city's social media on a bi-monthly basis, updating on lookaheads and achievements. We've also set up the project hotline and email last year and actively monitored it. The interactive web-based map showing anticipated traffic detours and lane closures was posted on the city's website in February and included in the broadcast starting in early March. And you can visit the map directly at mckinleyupdates.com. And lastly, we will have routine area drone, time-lapse, and other photography throughout the construction of the project to share with the public and available on the website. I will now pass this back over to Matt for our question and answers. Thanks, Savat. That does include our presentation for this evening, which means we will now transition into the Q&A portion of the meeting. For those on the Zoom platform, you can submit your questions using the Q&A function there on your screen. And if you're joining us on the phone, you can submit questions to mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. As previously mentioned, we will also do our very best to answer as many questions as possible. With that said, we've already had a couple of questions roll in. So the first one uh, we have here is there is a long wait along McKinley going north in the morning. What is the city going to do to help reduce the congestion during construction? Savat, would you like to answer that one? Yes, thank you, Matt. So as discussed in the presentation, we are evaluating how to implement video detection and timing adjustments to the Samson Avenue. 
and Estelle Street intersections to help alleviate it as much as possible. So with every major project with significant lane closures and improvements, there's always an, an early adjustment period where we are in the process of implementing some of those adjustments to increase the safety and minimize the impacts for through traffic and hoping to have them installed soon. Thanks a lot. We also had another one come in. I think it was more of a clarification question about pedestrian activity continuing through construction. Uh, Josh, can you answer that one? Absolutely. Yeah, the goal is to have a pedestrian uh, access crossing uh, McKinley throughout the project and Samson. There might be some later stages though, when we're actually uh, having the bridge in place and everything's vertical where that just might not be possible. We've been looking at options on how to do that, you know, but if, if that's the case, we're, we're working on other implementations. So pedestrian accessibility could be maintained north and south along McKinley. Um, but for the most part, uh, that's our goal. Thanks, Josh. We have another one here just entered. Uh, will trains passing through the construction area be slowed, which may cause delays at the various train crossings in the city? Savat? The, the answer is, is no. Again, that is the goal, but there will be times when it might be unavoidable when during work to switch temporary signal modifications for switchovers for traffic control. And with that said, it would be over uh, two to three hour segments when it happens and should happen sparingly. Thanks a lot. We have another one about construction. Uh, this one I think will be for Darren. Uh, is there a way to minimize the noise during construction? Darren, can you answer that one? Yeah, we, um, regarding the noise, we're working with the contractor, we're working with the utility companies as much as possible to identify areas where we can accelerate the construction or get you know some of the night work done when feasible and when it's safe. Um, we did have noise study actually performed back during the design phase of the project during the environmental phases. And we wanted to make sure that all the, the noise that was anticipated you know, falls within the city and county noise ordinance thresholds, which it does. Um, but with all that said, we are sensitive to the fact that noise construction creates and you know, the, the, there is a lot of noise and, and we'll work with the contractor to minimize all the noise as best we, extent we can. Thank you, Darren. I could see the question still rolling in. We also have another one regarding construction. When lanes are closed on Estelle, where will the business employees park? Josh? Uh, thanks. Yeah, so the lane closures won't go uh, into any kind of driveway closures or parking closures. Uh, uh, so there shouldn't be uh, impacts to where uh, people park in the actual kind of industrial areas to the to the west of the project. Um, you know, and we've worked out where there'd be temporary driveway closures to some of the adjacent properties, uh, specifically uh, Ewing and uh, the shopping center with Popeyes. Uh, but for the most part, it shouldn't impact uh, the parking for anybody west of the project. Thanks, Josh. The next question regards funding. Is the project going to stay within the approved budget? For that, I'll pass it off to Savat. Uh, currently, we are projecting to be under the approved budget, and as mentioned in the presentation, we will uh, continue to work on value engineering ideas with our contractor and construction management consultant to prevent unforeseen conditions like material shortages and escalation. Um, additionally, we are scheduled to expend all funds and complete project improvements long before uh, funding expenditure deadlines. Thank you, Savat. We have another one rolling in. Um, is there going to be an on-site contact that us tenants and residents can communicate with? Josh? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So um, yeah, there's not gonna be a specific person to contact. However, our construction management firm, Falcon Engineering has provided a dispatch kind of separate from the city's project hotline and the email. 
I'll, I'll kind of go through what the contact is, but um, uh, basically the phone number for the dispatch is 951-582-3793. Once again, that's, that's 951-582-3793. Please call the number, don't text it. Uh, if you need to write an email, then the email is mckinleyproject at falcon-ca.com. Again, that's uh, McKinley Project, all one word, at falcon-ca.com. We passed uh, out the uh, cards and whatnot to tenants on site. However, if anyone wants to have, uh, needed a copy of that card, just please include your request in these questions or reach out to the project hotline and we'll get you a digital, uh, digital copy to the card. Thank you, Josh. We have another construction question here. Uh, will construction take place 24 hours a day, five days per week? Um, how about Darren? Could you answer that one for us? Sure. Uh, yeah, it might feel that way, but uh, no, it won't be 24 hours a day, five days a week. It'll generally be during regular business hours, you know, during the week. But like I mentioned before, there will be some nighttime closures where we can you know, try to minimize noise on the private and commercial properties. So, uh, so yeah, it, it will not be a 24 hour a day operation for the most part. Thank you, Darren. We have a question that came in regarding the bridge. When will the bridge move occur and will there be intersection closures? Sabat? So we're expecting early spring 2023 and will be done on a weekend night between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. Um, yes, there will be planned long weekend closures at key intersections. However, we will provide ample notification to the public in advance for all planned closures. And uh, just to add to that, we will also be coordinating with any other closures that, um, um, that are happening on the freeway with the uh, other projects that RCTC or Caltrans is working on as well. Thanks, Savant. It looks like we have one more question I think you'll be able to answer. It's, will the entrance to Corona Palms on Estelle Street be blocked at any point? No, it will not be blocked at any point. Thank you. Okay, we have another one here regarding the McKinley-Magnolia intersection. This one says, even before the bridge work was started, there's a problem with people blocking the intersection when turning right. Or sorry, yeah, when turning right, left, or left, is there any funds to provide sheriff officers to provide tickets to people who do not follow these rules to not block the intersection? And if that's not possible, can we get better signage used to get people who don't follow the rules? Uh, for that, I think we'll pass it to Josh. Yeah, um, so that's actually funny this question came up. We had a traffic uh, meeting specifically to talk about some other things that were going on and this came up today as well. Um, and so we already plan on reaching out to the county to uh, have this enforced and notify them. It's outside of the city's jurisdiction, but with that said, um, you know, it's, it's these are part of some of the improvements that we're looking at um, with the traffic control adjustments as well. But the, kind of the next steps are going to be uh, uh, to um, uh, reach out to the county and see if they can uh, have someone out there to enforce it. Thanks, Josh. I think we have one more here for you. It says, when will construction occur? This project has been discussed for a long time. Oh, construction actually currently started, uh, as Darren talked about with the pile drilling operations. Uh, we anticipated actually to start a few months earlier, but we're struggling um, just in general with obtaining certain materials and, and uh, products that were crucial. So what we did is we opted to have the contractor start a little later while these items were procured. And that way it minimized the uh, general downtime and the impacts with these traffic control being in. You know, with that said though, as, as we talked about in the presentation, the overall schedule hasn't changed from what we anticipated completion at the end of 2023. Thanks, Josh. We have another question here. Is there a reason that the light south of Sampson was moved 20 feet north for stopping people short of the tracks. This person says that time and time again, the current timing of lights leaves the gap area empty, reducing the amount of vehicles by four to six vehicles. 
Additionally, can the tilt of the lights at Samson northbound be tilted up a bit? Right now, the lights are hard to see if the green or if the light is green. Josh. Yeah, so, so uh, I'll, I'll jump on this one. Um, so that was purposely put in, uh, number one, because we've had BNSF as part of the, the requirements, but uh, there was a conscious effort to make sure traffic didn't queue up anywhere near the train tracks. Uh, people get stuck in that, and that's where the accidents happen. So it's a safety matter. And uh, so we were, we are following and implementing the BNSF uh, guidelines and other safety practices uh, on that. And so I understand that it does create some delay issues, but the safety, uh, especially with the kind of congestion, is is our our ultimate concern um, in making sure there are no accidents uh, or issues with that of people being stranded. Uh, because we were too aggressive with the traffic control. Um, we did, uh, I think we're in the process or we've already uh, noticed, uh, I think the wind um, adjusted the uh, lights uh, a bit and that's what was creating some of the visibility issue. Um, they're, they're purposely designed so you see them at a certain area, but it looked like as of maybe a week or two ago, they were slightly adjusted. Uh, for whatever reason, and we had our contractor adjust them. So they should be more visible, um, you know, as of right now. Thanks, Josh. And I think I'll um, knock this other question back to you as well. This person wants to know if using police for traffic control during the morning will help with keeping traffic moving at a better rate. So this is kind of a double-edged sword here. Um, we did talk about this specifically. You heard a few of those items and the safety issues. Um, and we had uh, pretty open discussions with the, the, the city police chief and department. Uh, the challenge is, is uh, it, it, um, it, they, they have a, 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 a quantity of, of traffic cops that, uh, that cover the entire city. And so posting people out there, um, you know, permanently to help enforce this and monitor and, and keeping it a better rate is actually going to uh, be detrimental to that. And so um, there'll be times where there's safety issues or other elements um, that it would make sense and we would try to get them out there in, you know, periods of time. And we have active discussions with it, but it's not going to be something other than sparse, you know, but you heard a lot of the other improvements we're trying to do to help with this. Specifically, we think by uh, in implementing the video detection a little early um, at uh, those two intersections, Estelle and Samson, that's going to help with some of the signal issues and keep the traffic moving at a better rate. By installing some of the other improvements, it's going to keep some of the safety issues that we're concerned about um, to, to prevent further collisions or anything. Um, but well, it, it's one of these, it takes a little while to uh, just adjust to people's traffic patterns, no matter how much we model it in the planning phase. Every project I've ever been on, there's just tweaks and tweaks and tweaks and tweaks that just need to be done until, you know, everybody's used to the traffic control and, you know, it's, it's accounted for those patterns and habits. Thanks, Josh. As a reminder to those who are joining us on the Zoom platform, if you do have a question, you are able to submit your questions using the Q&A button on your screen. If you'd like to submit questions via email, you, you may also do so at mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. Right now, it doesn't look like we have any outstanding questions, but if you do have any, um, go ahead and use the Q&A function or, an e or email if you'd like. And we'll give everybody just a couple or minute, more minutes to think of any questions that you might have. Again, there's a Q&A function for you to use on the Zoom platform. If you're joining us by the phone, you can submit questions via email. You can see the email there on the screen, mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. We did receive a comment just to let everybody know that they think uh, these meetings are a very good way to keep us informed. Thank you for that note. Uh, we did have, it looks like we do have one question that just rolled in. It says, have you considered rerouting traffic to other intersections or via the 15 freeway on Magnolia? 
Josh? Well, you know what? I've been on a roll here, so why don't I just take this one? <laughs> um, you know, we do have an active posted detour plan with signage all throughout the area. Uh, I talked a little bit about it in the presentation. Um, you know, it, it, it's hard to go into detail without having the slides, but predominantly we urge people to use Magnolia to either the 15 or 91, depending on the direction you're going. Uh, the I-15 is a suitable um, uh, location. Um, you know, and, and you know, we can probably bring that slide up uh, again, uh, slide 15, I think it was. Um, and, and lastly, you know, Samson Avenue connects to Promenade Avenue, uh, same with Magnolia um, at the uh, Mariah Circle intersection. And so those are the suggested detours. We have signage posted out there. We've gone over this. And, and again, I'm going to reiterate something uh, that I think uh, I, I, I'm not even trying to, to brag here, but I've never seen a, a, a great separation construction of a major road like this. Lane closures go this smoothly before. Generally, there's a lot more congestion. And so I think that, that that's just a testament to how well everybody followed those detours and kind of avoided this area during the peak times. Um, and it seems like it's more of a constant flow of traffic as opposed to just major chaos for a couple hours a day, morning and night. And so uh, I do want to thank the public for that and paying attention. And, and, uh, and we're going to continue to broadcast through all the outreach efforts as well to make sure that happens. But uh, yes. Thanks, Josh. So we st I still see some questions rolling in. We have one regarding traffic lights again. So has the traffic light synchronization been, re been reconfigured on McKinley between Magnolia and Samson? Josh, I think that's also a question for you. Perfect. Um, to the best it can be. Uh, there are uh, things with Caltrans that they're not going to make this work as if it's a perfectly synchronized thing onto their ramps. Because uh, first and foremost, their focus is making sure their freeway facility is operating at the, the best. But with the tweaks we talked about with some video detection and some other uh, improvements along the northbound McKinley, it will be as optimized as it can be. It's just it's going to take a little bit of time to get those uh, improved because the video detection cameras in general, that's going to help with some of the loop resets that are happening at a cell when it gets backed up too much. Um, it, it, it takes a little bit of time to procure them, and we weren't anticipating procuring them for another few months. Perfect. Thank you. We had another question on uh, that just came up, and I think we can also go back to slide 15 for this one. This person wants to know what do all the numbers on the map mean? Uh, actually, so um, long story short, when I pulled that slide together, that was from our traffic management plan. And so as part of the detour, we actually studied all of those intersections from a construction traffic volume to see if improvements needed to be made. Um, so like, for example, that number 17 is the Mariah Circle. Um, and as a result of that analysis, we said, hey, the suggested traffic's going to need to have a temporary traffic signal in there. And so it actually means nothing to the overall conversation in, in this presentation. Um, I just didn't have a great graphic uh, handy um, for the detour plan that, that was nice and on an aerial, um, but it, really the, the, the numbers were from what we studied as part of our traffic management plan efforts. Thank you, Josh. Uh, this one, I think, is a good question for Savat to answer. It's asking, who is the general contractor and were they the lowest bidder? Savat? The general contractor is Walsh Construction. And by law, we are, we, we are required to choose the lowest responsible uh, bidder. And, uh, but just to um, assure you that Walsh Construction did go through a pre-qualification uh, process prior to the actual bid itself. So I just wanted to make sure that we answered that. Thanks, Savat. Right now we are looking at zero outstanding questions. I'll give everyone a couple, maybe a minute or two to see if they have any remaining questions. Again, you can use the Q&A function on your screen via Zoom. 
And if you're joining us by phone or prefer to send us an email with your question, you may do so at mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. Again, that's mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. So we'll give it about one more minute for any questions to roll in. If not, we'll move on with the presentation. With that said, we did just have a question roll in. This person wants to know, will traffic ever be blocked completely on McKinley? I'll pass that off to Darren, who may have discussed that earlier. Sure. Uh, no, we will always have one, at least one lane in each direction on McKinley. So we will not ever completely shut down the street because we know how important it is to keep that open. Uh, well, uh, let me just step in. There are going to be the need to do the 55 hour closures that you talked about at there. those intersections. Yes, you're yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So those will be the weekend closures of the intersections, but McKinley itself will still be open, right? No, the, there's going to be, uh, uh, oh, that's uh, true. Sorry, you're, um, yeah, I think uh, McKinley, you can still go North South, right? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's just the intersection to Estelle. Samson and the 91 ramps, you won't be able to get to and from the those streets to McKinley, but McKinley North South will be one lane all the time. And it looks like someone was clarifying on which intersections were those. So that would be Samson. Estelle, Estelle and then the, the 91, 91. Yeah. Yeah, ramps. Just the eastbound uh, off ramp, I believe it was. So looks like we have a couple more questions rolling in here. Just let us get the opportunity to process them before we answer. We have uh, no, I just I wanted to ahead, step in, provide one clarification. Apologize. It, it, it's it's a lot of it is just because we have it's been a while since we've looked at this, but uh, there will be during the 55 hour closures the need to temporarily close McKinley through lanes from time to time. It will. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So Good. apologize Thank, for the confusion. Nope. Just, Thanks for catching that, Josh. Yep. I couldn't uh, remember, but uh, yeah, I didn't think we were, but no, you're probably right. Thanks. We have a question here regarding progress reports. This person wants to know, would you have occasional progress reports for us via email and how often? Hmm. For that one, uh, maybe Savat or Josh. Uh, I'll jump into that one. Um, well, we're gonna do these presentations every quarter. Uh, and we do every two weeks, as we discussed in the presentation, kind of look aheads of what's going to go on via some of those public outreach uh, uh, efforts through all the city social media and the texting program. Um, I think the emails would be probably a little challenging, but we can look into that. Um, my suggestion is to be on the lookout for these because I think there, it's going to be far more informative of having these public presentations on a quarterly basis. And we're gonna to try to alternate them depending on COVID and availability and what's going on between virtual and in-person. Um, last one was in-person. Um, and, and we post all of these on the city's website within a week or two, usually afterwards. And so I think these are far more informative. And, and one of the things that we're really excited for too is uh, We'll have time lapse cameras, drone footage, other things that we could actually show construction in more detail too that you could see happen. And so I think you want to post into these. Uh, it'd be a lot easier to get more informed than uh, emails. 
Uh, Josh, I also wanted to add the we also provide quarterly updates to the city council as well. So um, that's kind of a more formal public meeting update that we didn't um, put in our presentation, but we also provide this information and uh, any recent updates. And the next quarterly council meeting is actually, uh, I believe it's next uh, Wednesday. So I just wanna give everyone a heads up that there are lots of ways to get updates. Thanks, Josh, and thank you, Sabat. We had a couple questions regarding the same thing. They wanna know when the projected completion date of this project will be. So uh, I can pass that over to Darren with that answer. Yeah, um, like I mentioned during the, in the presentation, and I realized some folks came in a little late, but yeah, we should be wrapping everything up by the end of next year, the end of 2023, and then demobilizing and cleaning up and you know finishing touches in early 2024. Thank you, Darren. Mm -hmm. We have another question here. I think Josh is best to answer this one. It is regarding, will those of us who live nearby or off McKinley Street, uh, will, be, will they be impacted? And then what, if any, advanced warnings will be offered? Um, well, I think we've been working pretty closely uh, for those that are directly impacted and even the ones that are indirectly impacted that, that you know have business impacts and whatnot. Um, but with regards to the kind of the greater question, what we have is kind of our advanced notices is it starts with getting on the city's website and paying attention to things like the, uh, 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 the texting program and opting into that because we send those texts out every a couple of weeks and the major uh, updates as necessary uh, to give as much notice as we can on things. Um, we have uh, the every other week and kind of key time notices through all the different public outreach uh, uh, and, and city uh, social media uh, efforts. Um, there's a fantastic tool that's been in place since the beginning of the year. Uh, that's the storyboard map. And that actually shows what the traffic control is and things that are going on and recent pictures. And so it's kind of a live and routinely updated uh, uh, deal that you could get on. Uh, there's just, you get on the city's McKinley Street Grade Separation Project website. Um, and so, and then we have these meetings and the quarterly updates as well. And so that's the kind of notices we'll do. Um, often with these ones too, we try to send out direct mailers every other meeting too, just to make sure we hit the greater area so you can keep, see what's gonna go on and, and what has gone on. Um, and so that's kind of the advance notice we're giving everybody. Thanks, Josh. And that story map Josh is referring to can easily be found also at McKinleyUpdates.com. We have another question that rolled in. Uh, it says, what other businesses will be closed, if any? Josh? Uh, none to our knowledge. Uh, the only two that actually closed before we were going to um, buy them out. We did end up having to buy them out uh, um, were Denny's and Outback, but uh, the intent is to preserve all the other businesses. The project isn't uh, in trying to close any businesses, um, so. Thanks, Josh. I think that wraps us up for the most outstanding questions. I'll allow maybe another 30 seconds to see if any more roll in. And one thing to add to that last question that I probably should have, um, I'm just kind of thinking about it since we have a little bit of downtime is uh, part of the reason, or all of the reason the city's doing the project is that as we have been actively looking at the train increases in traffic and whatnot, Downtime will go from the, you know, one to two hours a day to well over four hours a day with the train crossings. And so this is actually in the long haul to improve circulation and safety and, uh, you, know, you know, help the businesses out as the uh, train traffic and, and other uh, population increases. Thanks, Josh.
Going to give it about 30 more seconds to a minute to see if any more questions, if the attendees joining us do think of any more questions. Again, you can use the Q&A function on your screen if you're joining via the Zoom platform. If you're joining us by the phone, or if you'd like to send the question via email, as a reminder, you can do that at mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. Again, that's mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov. It looks like we have received another question. It says, many who live in home gardens speak only Spanish. Are you making any accommodations for communicating with Spanish speaking households? For that one, um, let's go with, um, how about Savat? Sorry about that, I was uh, muted there. So our bi-weekly emails are translated into Spanish and we offered um, Spanish tra translation for this meeting as well. So um, whenever there's a need or that we are aware that Spanish is required, we will make sure that we accommodate for it. Thanks, Thank Abad. Okay, I no longer see any questions. So we are going to go ahead and conclude the Q&A portion of our meeting. Thank you for joining us this evening. If we didn't get to your question tonight, we will be addressing the ones received to our project webpage on the City of Corona website. And we also encourage everyone to utilize the several different ways we have set up to stay connected to our project, which are shown here on the screen. You can reach us via email at mckinley.gs at coronaca.gov, the project website, through our project helpline number and by texting McKinley to 844-518-1409. Again, you can text McKinley to 844-518-1409. Thank you and that concludes our meeting for this evening. Thank you and have a great night.